that was my little history <laughs> uh, with going back to China. <laughs> yeah. So welcome to you, Afi. Uh, you. This is the opening debut episode, if you will, of both sides now. Guan Wang Dong Xi Ling Ting Zhuo Yu. Today we are in conversation with Abi Ngo, that Chinese history guy, connecting with a fellow overseas born Chinese who is currently documenting China's past. And hopefully, if time permits, we'll talk a little bit about China's present as well. As China reconnects with the world, it might be useful to pick up a set of tools to help us to decode the worldviews that determine or set the parameters of their behavior. So RP and myself, we are part of the Overseas Chinese Diaspora. This is the largest diaspora in the world, collectively making up between 40 to 50 million individuals and narratives, depending on who you read. And this number is significant because it will make the 30th largest country. Now, the number may seem like a lot, but it's really a speck of a speck in the scheme of 1.4 billion people in the current geopolitical boundaries of modern China. And I really wanted to connect with RP because of this book that I've read, China's Fourth Rise. So China, RP, we've spoken a little bit about uh, before we were, when we were preparing for this conversation about your passion and love for Chinese history. Yes. And we spoke about your familiarity with Professor Wang Gongwu, uh, whose, whose book I have over here. And he speaks a lot about the, the, what is unique about the Chinese history is their ability to harness central power, which is mm. something that I'm hoping to unpack a little bit more f with you today in our podcast. So Api, if I could hand the time over to you, Api is the creator of the YouTube um, channel, That Chinese History Guy. Thank you so much for being here today to help me unpack the history of the Chinese model. Warm welcome to you. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Hello, Bob. <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me on. And um, yeah, I am a Chinese guy by ethnicity living in Singapore. Uh, I believe I'm a fourth generation Singaporean now. Yeah, my great granddad came over from China. My grandfather was born here. So yeah, third or fourth gen, I always get mixed up. <clears throat> yeah, because uh, there's the overseas Chinese label, which is yeah. doesn't include the overseas born bit. So I think, yes. um, yeah, so fourth generation. Your so which, which generation do you start counting from? You yeah. know, I, I wish I there was a clear resource I could consult to get an answer <laughs> to that because I get the number. Am I second or third? Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure too. yeah exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, and uh, as you mentioned, I am the a, a storyteller on YouTube. I run that Chinese History Guy channel, mm -hmm. or I'm that Chinese History Guy, um, sharing the myths, legends, and histories of the Chinese people from the first creator to the last imperial dynasty. And the objective is to try to share all five, six thousand years worth of stories. <laughs> One video at a time. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a massively epic project. Um, yeah, what was I thinking? <laughs> five to six thousand years of recorded Chinese history. No, 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 not recorded. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, recorded would be about three thousand years, but mm -hmm. we have the myths, we have the right. legends, and everything. I see. That's that why it's so asking. expensive. Yes, the myths, yes. the legends, right down to the officially recorded histories, yes. which is yes. dating back 3,000 years. Um, yes. So right now you are at episode 95. Uh, 95 and, videos, yes. And Third I understand series. that your videos are approximately like 15 to 20 minutes each. Um, yes. Wow. How much, what's your workflow and process like uh, when uh. it comes to producing your work? <laughs> that's that's what I'm very curious about. Glad you asked, glad mm. you asked. Um, Basically, the writing alone, the writing yeah. alone takes about um, four to six hours per script. Yeah. The, that's just the writing. After I got everything, you know, together and sorted, the writing mm -hmm. alone was four to six hours. The yeah. shooting part is the easiest. I yeah. shoot, you know, one, one, one and a half hours per video and then edit it down. Yeah. Editing would be another six to eight hours. That would include, you know, making the maps and making the other resources that might be needed for the the video to tell the story and uh, research <laughs> research is never ending so mm -hmm. um 
I'm always either reading something or translating something into uh, stuff that I can yeah. use for the for the script or for the video. Mm -hmm. So that's that's um, that's why I work about twelve to fourteen hour days. Yeah. Uh, just to run the channel. I mean, on top of you know all the social media stuff that you have to handle as a creator today. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, that is like the physical workflow of it. Uh, thank God or mm -hmm. thank the powers that be or as a Chinese, thank the heavens. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I do not really have to, you know, um, work out the sequence of events or the sequence of the stories or chapters or episodes. I use a generally accepted um, sequence, which are basically uh, generally recognized throughout the Chinese history uh, world. Mm. So any history, Chinese history book or compendium you find, they would list out these events in more or less the same order. You know, sometimes right. of course I have to move things a bit around for continuity sake. Mm -hmm. But uh, so that is one big problem off my back. So mm -hmm. I don't have to decide which chapter comes before or after which chapter. Right. So that's all taken care of because I have this series of books that does that for me already. Yep. All I have to do is just to do my own research and um, seek out the source texts, mm -hmm. uh, figure out what the source texts are, are saying and then um, translate it first to modern Chinese and then translate that to modern English so mm -hmm. that uh, my audience can understand these uh, stories and uh, what happens in them. And that is basically one of the primary reasons why I started this uh, channel, mm -hmm. to give access to people who might be interested in Chinese history and Chinese culture, but have always faced this obstacle of uh, language. You mm -hmm. know, they could not read or they could not understand the language. So they could not um, have access to this rich, yeah. uh, interesting stories and histories and events that happen. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's that's me mm -hmm. in a long-winded nutshell. Yeah, in some ways, <laughs> uh, providing a bridge, and yeah, kind hopefully, of like a, a hopefully. Western frame. I think if I can, if I'm quoting you correctly from our earlier conversation. Yes, uh, in China. a way, I, I mean, not so much a Western frame, but more mm -hmm. of the 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 Eastern narration of Chinese history, mm -hmm. but just presented in another, presented language. In another yeah. language. Rather than being the Western framing of mm -hmm. Chinese history. Ah. Yeah. So, so, you know, if we are talking about the Western framing of Chinese history, we are talking about uh, Sinology mm -hmm. as, uh, as uh, what is being taught in uh, Cambridge or Oxford. Mm -hmm. But um, sometimes you'll find very different um, approaches and angles to a similar events, you yeah. know, if we read the the academia from the East, yeah. from China, yeah. you know, and the mm -hmm. academia from the West, from UK or America. So mm -hmm. that is actually quite interesting to a certain extent. We, we yeah. might talk about that in some future episodes if mm. we actually do that. Yeah. yeah. So rather than just uh, being fixated on one point of view or one perspective, balancing yes. it out from perhaps where it happened, or at least an interpretation coming from the people, where the events yes. had occurred. I mean, tell um, the story as the original people, as the original people told it, like, you know, yeah. without a, a, a colored lens over it yeah. or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course, along the way, things get lost in interpretation, whether it's oh, yes. meaning oh, yes. <laughs> or values. Um, oh, yeah. So if I can j kind of dive into your latest episode, um, sure. It was Death by Crocodiles. And sorry for I, kind of jumping around the questions. <laughs> actually, the episode yeah. was uh, King Zhao's Southern Expedition. But yeah. yeah, the thumbnail is Death by Crocodiles. Yeah. Click, so, click bait, la, you know. <laughs> so this was episode uh, 22 in 8th of February this year. Uh, yeah. So it's episode an episode 22 about King Wen. Of, uh, no, King Zhao of the King Zhou Zhou Dynasty. Yeah. I see. King Zhao mm -hmm. of the Zhou Dynasty. Mm -hmm. Will be King Wen's uh, great, great, great grandson. Yeah. Wen Wu Chen Kang Zhao. Yeah, his great, great, great grandson. <laughs> I see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. So yes, one of the the key themes I think it really stuck in my mind because it's something that my dad would usually uh, talk about when I was growing up with him is that prosperity does not last beyond three generations. Mm -hmm. Um. So what are some lessons we can draw? Uh, from that example in Chinese history? Actually, it's not just Chinese history. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, um, 
in the comment section of that video, one of my viewers, one of the audience actually said that there was a similar saying uh, reflected in, in uh, Arabic saying mm. that, you know, uh, prosperity or, or good times do not last through a few generations. Yeah. So, and then re I, I guess this is a very universal idea that uh, things, things are not always rosy and mm. especially, you know, uh, it doesn't uh, last through generations. I think yeah. there's this saying that hard times create strong men and mm -hmm. strong men create good times. Good times create weak men and weak men create hard times. Like a that cycle, cycle mm -hmm. that goes on and on. Mm -hmm. And yeah, universal concept. And I believe, this is my personal opinion, that underlying this, this, this issue, the, the problem, is that we all forget, all of us, no, mm -hmm. no exception. We do not learn the lessons that uh, our, our predecessors went through. Uh, I mean, much as we like to think that we would, you know, learn lessons, uh, we always forget and we will go on to repeat the same mistakes and the same errors that our ancestors and our predecessors go through because life got too good, we got too arrogant and we got too complacent. And this is something we always have to keep in mind. And um, usually we remember to keep it in mind for about two to three generations and then the whole cycle repeats itself again because life mm -hmm. got too good. Life got yep. too comfortable. Yeah. Yep. That is certainly a very uh, insightful observation. So if I could maybe present you with the unenviable task of uh, giving us like a chronological landscape of, of, of recorded uh, Chinese history, um, um, what does that look like, sound like, if I could hand the time over to you? Okay, mm -hmm. um, this is going to take a while. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah. Chinese history, mm -hmm. if we are going to talk about the whole series yeah. of, uh, of dynasties and events. So we will start with the age of myth, which mm -hmm. is a lot of um, legends and a lot of uh, pseudo, pseudo history. Mm -hmm. um, we will go the age of myth where we have the three sovereigns and the five tiaks or the five king, uh, five emperors, San Huang Wu Di. So that is the age of myth. Uh, it will last from the first creator from Pan Gu's creation of the world until the semi-mythical figure of Da Yu, the flood tamer, mm -hmm. who would presumably uh, be one of the founders of the Xia dynasty. Now the Xia dynasty is uh, still a hotly contested dynasty. There are no actual um, proof of its existence, but uh, apart from ancient writings, so next, after the Xia dynasty, it is an archaeologically, archaeologically proven dynasty that existed mm -hmm. uh, from around the 1675 BC to around 1046 BC. Uh, this would be the Shang dynasty. And we have uh, Oracle Bones and Oracle Bone script, which is uh, the, the first form of Chinese writing uh, that has been unearthed. And mm. so we have proved that the Shang Dynasty exists mm -hmm. uh, between the 1675 BC to 1046 BC. Mm -hmm. And after that, and this is the series that I'm doing right now on my mm. channel, is the yeah. Zhou Dynasty. Zhou Dynasty. Mm -hmm. And this will be the first uh, officially documented and archaeologically proven dynasty mm -hmm. in Chinese history. Mm -hmm. uh, officially documented as in that we have first-hand source text Mm. that comes from this uh, period of time and, you know, that documents the events, like official documentation with official uh, court historians of the period. So this Zhou Dynasty, technically, it would last from 1046 BC to 256 BC. That's, and the that's, longest, wow. longest ruling history in... Uh, 700 longest ruling, years or so? Uh, 900? Nine? 700, uh, no, mm -hmm. no, seven, seven, eight hundred 800 years. Mm -hmm. So technically the longest ruling dynasty in uh, Chinese history. However, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the Zhou dynasty itself was broken up into a few separate pieces. So it started with the Western Zhou dynasty, which actually lasts from 1046 BC until roughly about um, 771 BC. 
And this uh, breaking point, this transition point would be the moving of the official capital of the Zhou ruling house from Haojing in around Xi'an area to Luoyang, uh, which they call the East, Eastern capital. Mm -hmm. And so therefore from the Western Zhou, we move into the Eastern Zhou. And the Eastern Zhou itself is basically split into two eras as well, the spring and autumn period and the warring states period. So the spring and autumn period would be the 771 BC to about 476 BC. Now the exact date is actually uh, disputed as well because depending on which event you take as a breaking point. So that would be the spring and autumn. Uh, usually we say 476 BC because that's when the state of Jin was split into the state of Zhao Wei and Han. And from that onwards is the warring states period where you have these uh, major massive wars and battles that was going on to assert uh, dominion over the realm. And that will end in 221 BC uh, under the Qin dynasty, which as we all know is founded by the first emperor Qin Shi Huangdi. Mm -hmm. So that would be the end of the entire pre-dynasty, pre-empire China. So that is a, a, a what do you call that? A, a breaking point of uh, two major blocks of uh, Chinese history, what we call the um, um, pre-Qin era and the post-Qin era, the mm. pre-empire days and the post-empire days. Mm. So from the Qin dynasty onwards, we have the Chinese emperors. Before mm. that, we don't have emperors and we don't have uh, the Chinese empire as we know it. You know, mm -hmm. so from the Qin Dynasty 221 BC onward, uh, Qin Dynasty lasted for a very short time, uh, less than 20 years, 221 BC to 206 BC. And then they were overthrown by the Han, which itself technically survived from 206 BC to 220 AD or 220 CE. Mm -hmm. Technically, because once again, it's split into a few parts. Uh, the Western Han will be 206 BC until 9 AD from Liu Bang's uh, overthrowing of the Qin Dynasty until the Wang Mang Rebellion. And in between, we have this very short period of time from 9 AD to 23 AD, where Wang Mang built the Xin Dynasty, or uh, Xin Chao, you know, in, in a way um, proclaiming that what he's bringing to the realm is something new and something innovative. Uh, and that would last until 23 AD with the sacking of Chang'an and Liu Xiu, a uh, descendant of the original Han royal family will reclaim the Han throne and once again move the capital to Luoyang. I mean, you mm -hmm. notice a, a pattern here. Mm -hmm. The original capital will be a Xi'an or Chang'an by this time. And then they will move it to Luoyang in the east. And then now it becomes the Eastern Han. And mm -hmm. Eastern Han will you know, reign from 25 CE until 220 CE, which um, will transition into what? will most probably be the most popular period of Chinese history is the Three Kingdoms period. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people will presume because you play the games or you read the novels that the Three Kingdoms were started from 184 or 189, but uh, that is actually when the Yellow Turban Rebellions happened. And the Three Kingdoms period was not officially in place until 220 CE, where you really literally have three kingdoms, you know, splitting up the entire uh, Chinese uh, empire. And so uh, that was also when the Han uh, finally abdicate the throne. So the real three kingdoms was actually 220 CE to 265 CE, uh, after which it transitioned into a Jin dynasty, uh, which was 265 to 420. And then it went into like a couple of hundred years of chaos. Mm -hmm. uh, that we call the northern and southern, uh, northern and southern dynasty, and that is when the northern steppe tribes came south, and the Han people moved from the Yellow River region yep. to the more southern Yangtze River region. That was the first uh, big migration of the Han people from the north to the south, and uh, it was also the first big assimilation of the northern steppe people into the the. Chinese, uh, they got, uh, what, what's that term called? Sinocized. Mm -hmm. The Northern Steppes people got Sinocized. The Huns, wow. the Jurchens, okay. the, the, the Steppes. So this tribe. is a Chinese way of thinking, way of behavior being adopted. 
Yes. So they took took on. Yes, exactly. This was the first major assimilation of a foreign uh, people into becoming Chinese. I mean, these northern people, they um, picked up the language. They even changed their names. Uh, took on Chinese surnames and uh, took on Chinese cultures. In fact, they were all Sinocized during this time. Mm-hmm. And so this was a Northern and Southern Dynasty, which was 386 AD to 589 AD. And these hundreds of years of chaos would uh, finally, this whole land would be reunited again under the Sui Dynasty, mm-hmm. which was once again a very short-lived dynasty, only uh, two generations. And this would be 581 CE until 618 CE. And during this period of time, it would be kind of the, the fall of Confucianism as a mainstream thought as the only mainstream philosophy. And this was also the period of time where Buddhism and Taoism gained a much bigger foothold in the mm-hmm. Chinese psyche. So mm-hmm. 581 to 618, uh, which was followed by what most um, historians will call the golden age of Chinese history, which is the mm. Tang Dynasty. The Tang Dynasty would uh, reign from 618 to 906. So this was a period of time where the uh, a very big um, expansion of Chinese influence, Chinese influence spread extremely far during this time, all, all the way into the Persian Empire uh, in the West, where you have these uh, Persian traders and all the what do you call that? All the stuns, the 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 the, the middle uh, middle Asia small kingdoms, you know, today's Afghanistan, Tajikistan, and all these places where they will have sent envoys and traders into the Chinese Empire of that time, and <clears throat> art was flourishing, uh, language flourished, culture flourished, and the Chinese people exported a lot of its traditions and a lot of its culture uh, to other countries today. Like um, uh, a lot of the Japanese culture and tradition, a lot of the Korean culture and tradition were actually um, descendants of Tang culture and Tang Mm -hmm. court etiquette. And so, in fact, a lot of these um, etiquettes and this uh, culture stuff, you can find in Korea and Japan, but you can't find in China today. Mm -hmm. So that is pretty interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Um, Then from the Tang Dynasty, there were a few uprisings and, you know, of course, with every dynasty that happens. And then, uh, but finally it fell in uh, 906 and it went into another period of uh, extreme chaos. Mm -hmm. Luckily, this time it was not that long, just a few decades, Mm -hmm. um, which we call Wu Tai Shi Guo or the Five Dynasties and Ten Kingdoms where five different dynasties and 10 different kingdoms were actually uh, ruling the land at the same time. And these will all end at the end of uh, 960 AD and coalesce or be united once again under the Mm -hmm. Zhao family. And uh, we have the Song dynasty, Song Chao. This would be the most culturally and economically vibrant um, dynasty in Chinese history, actually. Um, a lot of these uh, scientific um, innovations that we know today will always say that, oh, gunpowder was invented in China, paper was invented in China, um, printing press was invented in China. Well, it all happened during the Song Dynasty. Mm -hmm. And economically, it was extremely rich. If I'm not wrong, the Song Dynasty's economy, basically the economical output of the Song Dynasty took up about 80% of global economy at the time. Mm. So, yeah, just think about it. 80% of the economy of the entire world came from the Song Dynasty. And this was about 960 AD to 1279 AD. And this was also the period of time where Confucianism went through a reform and uh, a revival and became the official Hmm. uh, ideology of the Chinese yeah, people. That's can I can I pause you there for a second yes. because that's that's really um, making me think a lot about they're willing to go back to a model from the past. Yes. To to do things because one might argue that most people think that's counterintuitive. You wouldn't go repeat something that's failed before, but they've given it a new lease of life. Is this the first time they've done something like this? Because uh, you. 
I, I wouldn't say that Confucianism has failed yeah. uh, previously. It's mm-hmm. just that things were uh, more vibrant and more diverse during the 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 Tang and the Sui uh, mm-hmm. dynasties or even uh, yeah the Sui and Tang dynasty were actually more diverse. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say it's more a case of the Song dynasty were getting more and more. This was actually the start of um, the the Han people, the Han civilization, mm-hmm. withdrawing more and more back into itself, mm-hmm. and. Um, the whole idea of uh, reviving and reforming Confucianism during the Song Dynasty was actually more political than uh, philosophical. I see. Yes. And um, there's a reason why I don't really like the Song Dynasty, mm-hmm. but maybe we'll get to that okay. later. Right. Yeah. But Song Dynasty, uh, to, to continue with this uh, narration, um, yeah, biggest economy in the world. And yeah, sorry. Uh, the economy of the Song Dynasty was three times the size of the entire European economy of the time. Sorry, mm-hmm. I might have made a bit of a mistake. Mm-hmm. So, and, but the Song Dynasty, the same thing, it was split into Northern Song and Southern Song. The Northern Song had their capital in um, Kaifeng, today's Kaifeng, if I'm not wrong. So uh, that was from 960 AD until 1127 AD, where the biggest humiliation the Han Dynasty has ever um, experience happened where Emperor Jing and Emperor Kang of the Song Dynasty was actually taken hostage and brought back to the north by the Jurchens who mm. were invading. And so they lost two emperors at the same time, mind you, it was not like one after the other. They took both of them at the same time. And uh, the Jurchens swept south and the Song were facing defeat after defeat and they had to retreat south of the Yangtze and rebuild the whole court there with, uh, I think, a, 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 a Kader branch of the Zhao family. And that is where we call the Southern Song. And they were very comfortable and very, very vibrant uh, culture and economy in the Southern Song as well. And that would be from um, 1127 AD to 1279 AD until uh, that was when the Mongols came. And the Mongols took care of the Jurchens in the north and they swept even further south and they finally forced the entire Southern Song Court. Actually, I'm not exaggerating. This is really what happened. The mm-hmm. entire Southern Song Court in a bid to escape the Mongols actually had to retreat all the way out into the sea. Like they built ships mm-hmm. and the entire court went onto the ships and they lost all the land mass and they had to go to the sea. And the last emperor of the Song Dynasty actually drowned in the sea, he died, he drowned. And that was the official end of the song as we know it. So yeah, the Mongols came 1279 and short-lived dynasty from Kublai to I think his grandson or his great-grandson, 1368 BC, where the Han people once again rose up uh, and retook the realm, retook the throne Mm -hmm. uh, and formed the Ming dynasty from 1368 to 1644. And there's this running joke about the Ming Dynasty. The Ming Dynasty has 16 emperors, but there were only two and a half good ones. The rest of them are practically idiots. So that's a running joke about the Ming Dynasty. And then uh, the Ming Dynasty fell in 1644 to the descendants of the Jurchens, who by now call themselves the Manchurians. And they were sweeped in in 1644 and built the Qing Dynasty. And this will be the last imperial dynasty in China. And it will last until 1912. In 1911, Dr. Sun Yat-san would um, uh, uh, instigate the uprising. And then in 1912, the last emperor of China would abdicate and China would officially move into uh, Republican China in 1912. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's about what? Five six thousand years of Chinese history in a nutshell. Mm-hmm. Sorry for going on and on for, no, for that bit. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for unpacking that chronology for us. Um, some keywords that kind of popped in my mind as mm-hmm. I was hearing your your narration were it seems to be I think first a trend of centralizing and then disintegrating, <laughs> centralizing again and yes. then disintegrating again. Uh, that's number one and number two. Uh, I think if there's a dividing line, there's the pre-Tin 
yes. and the post Qin significant because before that it was largely feudal. There was a lot of disintegrated uh, states, and then post Qin you finally had some semblance of central power. Um, yes. So those are my two takeaways. Have I missed out on anything um, mm. you reckon so far? No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that's basically it. I yeah, mean, thank you for the education. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that's super cool. Um, so sorry for that really uh, big and open-ended epic question uh, at the very beginning. Uh, no um, but if we could maybe now uh, narrow it down a little yes. and let's spend some time talking about your favorite dynasty and and why that would be the case and then leading on from that what's the one that you least like we'll start with the one that's your favorite my favorite would be the Qin dynasty actually the Qin. Mm -hmm. short lived as it may be and yeah. uh, generally hated as it may be mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I really just love the how this whole Qin dynasty happened because it did not happen in one generation so, mm -hmm. It so happened historically. It's fifteen years or so the Qin Dynasty. Yes, in but, existence. Um, you can't just look at that period in isolation because there was some, from an earlier conversation, some intergenerational. Oh yes. <laughs> setting up. Uh, oh yes. To get up to that point, so. Yes. It took about six generations yeah. of of setting up for that to happen. You know, mm. started from the time where the Qin state were not even considered. Uh, they did not even have the title of kings right. at that time. They were just dukes. Dukes. So is that one level down? So if you can help me unpack yeah, that. One, yeah, one level down from uh, from king. So, yeah. uh, you know, noble titles, we have the king or the prince, mm -hmm. depending on which version you, you use. So we have the kings, the dukes, the marquess, then the counts, the viscounts, if I'm not mm -hmm. wrong. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they were still dukes at that time. And they were the weakest state among the warring states. Mm -hmm. The weakest and uh, most looked down upon uh, the Qin people were considered half savages. They were not even considered, uh, um, what do you call that, uh, civilized Han people at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, that was about 360, 365 BC. Yeah. Uh, it was said that uh, when Confucius himself was traveling around the realm to spread his teaching, he refused to step into the lands of the Qin people. That was how uncivilized that the, the central plain civilization felt they were. That mm. even Confucius would refuse to step into the Qin state. Wow. And so they're really yeah. at the periphery. Yeah, they were mm. really at the periphery. And, Physically um, and also as part of the culture. Yes. Oh yeah, they, 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 mm. they live all the way to the west. Yeah. Like really to the west in uh, where would be today's uh, uh, even more west than Xi'an today. Mm. So that was a uh, the western tip of the of the of the land at that time, yeah. and so it took from Qin Xiao Gong Duke Xiao of Qin from that uh, from his generation he instituted political and legal reforms, and he employed the ideologies of the legalist school of thought, which was kind of counter counter culture, you know, because Confucianism and, and Wang Tao was the mainstream uh, ideology of the realm at that mm -hmm. time. So he went the other way. He went with legalism uh, with, and all his pragmatic um, ideas. You know, he used that and started the reform mm -hmm. and it took six generations, mm -hmm. about six, gen five to six generations. Mm -hmm. And he really built up the entire tick, laid mm -hmm. down the tick foundation. Mm -hmm that they needed from being the smallest and the weakest and the poorest state, they managed over six generations to build up enough foundation to finally mm. conquer the entire realm and um, you know, build an empire. And because of their, the ideology that they followed, uh, they brought forth uh, an entirely new political system at that time. They did away with the entire feudal system where you have autonomous um, lords of the realm that paid tribute and just swear fealty to the central court. They brought about the province system where every piece of land they conquered, they just put in appointed an administrator to take care of this land. So and you're drawing they, a salary instead yeah, of giving them power. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You have a regional manager or regional director, yeah. you mm -hmm. know, sort of. Mm -hmm. and, and this was extremely efficient and it was extremely scalable. 
you don't have to deal with you know different ideology or or, or different uh, points of view. You just say, HQ wants to do this. Your job is to implement this and do it. And it's scalable because the whole system is just a copy and paste, you know, wherever they go. And so they were able to unify the entire realm and then standardize writing, standardize measurements, uh, standardize the width of the roads, and um, basically form the root, the basis of what we now know as Chinese culture and traditions. Mm -hmm. And the accomplishments that, that happen under the first emperor, under the, the Qin dynasty when it was founded, uh, even though it was just a short, like what, 15, 20 years, as we have mentioned, uh, I believe the total amount of accomplishment that was achieved during that short period of time is equivalent to all other accomplishments that came after it. Like if you put the 80-20 rule, that's like the 20% of the time in Chinese history that accomplished like 80% of everything that we know today. Mm -hmm. And another bit of trivia, China, the term China is basically from the Qin people. If we use the Wits Jiao's translation, uh, Qin was uh, translated as C-H-I-N, not Q-I-N as in today, C-H-I-N. And when they were the West was trying to name China, they used Qin as its basis and call it China. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it even gave China its English name today. So what's there not to be impressed about? <laughs> yeah. How about the dynasty that you liked the least? Uh, I mentioned briefly just now, I really, really yeah. don't like you the Song Dynasty. You were kind of like foreshadowing that already. Yeah, I really don't like the Song Dynasty. On a scale of 1 to 10, like how much is this don't like? I, I, I dislike them more than I like the Qin. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's and, going, and, not 11. <laughs> yeah, like all the way up to 11, man. Yeah. Jet Black will be proud. Like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and I, I guess by saying what I say, I'm actually alienating a lot of uh, Sinophiles because mm -hmm. uh, most Sinophiles will go the totally opposite direction. They will love the song Dynasty. I hate the Qin Dynasty. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I really don't like the song. Uh, number one, yes, they were economically the strongest in the world at the time. Um, they were culturally extremely vibrant at the time. A lot of innovations happened during that time. However, what happened during the Song Dynasty really screwed over the Chinese people until today. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned just now the confusion re uh, reform and the confusion revivalism happened mm -hmm. during the Song Dynasty. And this reform was more politically, uh, it was more of a political uh, reasoning behind mm -hmm. this confusion reform than any philosophical uh, reasons. Confucianism was reformed to the to better to help the ruling class better control the masses. I think that's the, the way mm. to put it. So, so the ideology became politicized. Extremely or, politicized. Or extremely politicized. Because Confucianism is hard to describe, right? I guess to uh, 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 somebody who's not aware of what it actually represents. Because it's not quite a religion, is it? It it's, is a philosophy. It's a philosophy. Yes. So it should be more correctly labeled as a philosophy uh, and outlook. And yes. you're saying that this this revival, uh, so it had it had its day before, but it had a revival, and that and then that ideology, that system of thinking became politi politicized. Politicized, yes. Mm -hmm. And and so, what, in what way? Okay, in a nutshell, to to kind of like shed a bit of light on what Confucianism is. Confucianism mm, is you. basically the study of human relationships mm -hmm. and the definition. Of human relationships, yeah. how people should be interacting with each other, and, yeah. and yes, in a way, mm -hmm. and uh, what is a person's place in the world, in society, the hierarchy. It is, yeah, I guess you could call it a very, very early form of uh, proto social science. Mm. Uh, that's what Confucianism is in a mm -hmm. nutshell, if yep. we're going to like really simplify it. Mm -hmm. And what happened in the Song Dynasty was that the, the, the Confucian reform, what happened was that it made these guidelines, it turned all these guidelines into strict rules. 
Mm. So, you know, rather than say that you should be doing this, it became, this is the law that you must do this. You must respect your elders. You must be loyal to your king. You must be, uh, you, it, it almost created a caste system in society. And the thing is, by this time, Chinese history, we already have social mobility as in the, mm. through the, what do you call it, um, the exam system, where you have the literati class who could take imperial exams to advance their, themselves. So you could be a peasant, but if you are a well-educated person, you could take the exam and then you could uh, become one of the aristocrats or one of mm -hmm. the ruling class. You become an official, you know, the zhuang yuan, tan hua, you become, yeah. you know, this, this system. And the, the basis of this exam, there was only one topic. There was only one subject. It was Confucianism. Mm. So mm. in order to be, to elevate your social status to, you know, from a peasant to maybe a ruling class, you have to pass the exam. And to pass the exam, you must be very good at understanding mm. Confucianism. You must have internalized it. Yes. <laughs> to get to the level where... You yeah. might not believe mm. it. You might not have internalized it. But at mm. the very least, you must be Exposure. able to write down. Yeah. Yeah. To, to explain, you know, Exposure what it is. Exposure and practice because there's the writing component of it as well. And then answering. Yes. yes. And, and, and this Confucian reform at that time that placed these very st strict rules or human behavior on um, obedience, you know, obedience to mm -hmm. a higher authority, you know, could be your father, could be your supervisor at work, could be, you know, all, you know, level by level all the way up to the yeah. emperor. And this was not what Confucius intended in the first place. Mm -hmm. Confucius was talking about human relationships, yeah. you know, how it should look and how to build a harmonious uh, society. That was Confucius' yeah. How to uh, build rather than impose. Yes. It's two completely different approaches. And on, on that note, um, um, if I can further unpack the Northern, the Song Dynasty, yes. um, the population, I'm doing a bit of research on this online. I'm not sure if I can verify okay. the source. Okay. But during the Song Dynasty, the population had increased from like 60 million to 140 million. Oh yeah. So they 2x or more than 2x their population. Oh yeah. And I'm I'm wondering if is is it is it is it then a necessary thing they had to do to impose such a system because the population had ballooned to such a size it's difficult to exert control with um, a um, set of guidelines rather than laws. There was a few different reasons. Yeah. Uh, one of the main reasons was once again political because mm -hmm. the founder of the Song Dynasty, Zhao Kuang Yi, yeah. he came to power through rebellion. Mm. He revolted against his rightful leech, mm. uh, uh, rightful lord. Mm -hmm. So he rebelled and declared himself emperor. Mm -hmm. So after he gained power, he was like, ah, I can't have another me happening. Mm -hmm. So he took away the, he was a general. Yeah, he was a military man. So after he came to power, he kind of stripped the military people of their powers and um, instead um, put this um, literati into positions of power to control the soldiers and the generals. Mm -hmm. And so he had to come up with a system to make sure mm -hmm. that he have this uh, total control over the people. And to be very honest, uh, population growth um, most of the time, I would mm. say, uh, during these uh, imperial days, dynasty days, yeah, peasants are peasants. Uh. Mm. Peasants are not in the equation, basically. Mm. You want to... They have very little start, agency. They are yes, extremely subject to the flows. Yeah. Mm. Yes. So mm. unless something really uh, uh, exceptional happens, then they come into the equation. Mm. But usually, most of the time, they are not even in the equation at all mm -hmm. when uh, making political decisions is usually yeah. just from the literati class yeah. and above. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Si, si zi, si tai fu class, mm -hmm. that level above, then they come into the, the considerations. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this reform and this, this uh, implementation of this new reform was basically very political to exert control over people who might pose a threat to the royal family. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. So yeah, the the population growth, uh, it basically just added to the coffers of the court. Not mm-hmm. really much else. Yeah. Because mm. at the end of the Salvan song, according to what I'm looking at, of course, do your own research, everyone. Uh, the population was thirty nine percent of the global population by oh, yeah. the Southern Song. Mm-hmm. At the start, it was twenty three percent of global global population. So that. <laughs> that's a lot of individuals added into the empire oh, if yeah. we will wow okay that's pretty fascinating it's, it's a feat that they've never re- replicated it's doubly, ever it's doubly fascinating scene, you know considering the fact that the song mm. the southern song was actually less than half the size of of, yeah. of China because <laughs> that's my exposure with the Song Dynasty I used yeah. to play this game called Sui Wu Zuan the, oh, yeah. the bandit kings of ancient China it's uh, yeah. from a floppy uh, no before a floppy disk the <laughs> um no is it the floppy disk or is it the three and floppy. a quarter i can't remember the more solid one i remember playing on that oh, and sure. yeah sure. it was okay. like a, in a race against time to oh, yeah. to to kind of like unify the empire before the oh, at yeah. least what they called in the game the northern invaders <laughs> oh, yeah. um so that's my point of reference so it's really interesting to to have you unpack this part of chinese history for me um so confucian reform you said has screwed us over ever since. Ever would that since. be would that be ever. right to say? And and yes. And until it, today we still have that. We are still unable to break ourselves break free of that out model. of that straight jacket. Yeah. Straight that's a better way of putting it. So yeah, it, it's a straight jacket. It informs your behavior through what it tells you you can do and you cannot do. Right? Yes. yes. It's like a invisible OP marker that you and put it, in oh, your, on yourself. Yeah. Invisible OB out of bounds marker. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Right. So it's like a mental yeah. filter that actually paralyzes you from I mean, I, from... I have no issues with Confucianism, like mm-hmm. what Confucius himself uh intended, but I do have a lot of issues with the with Song the poli- Dynasty politicization of that. Yeah, of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's good for rulers. This new reformed Confucianism is extremely good for rulers or mm-hmm. anyone in the ruling class, but it sucks to be one of the people that's, you know, uh, being ruled by this ideology. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, if I can, I'd like to move us on to kind of like a more macro view of right. the significance of, of looking at, at Chinese history. Right. Um, what have you learned by adopting this longer horizon? Um, I think I could describe it as a longitudinal look at Chinese history. Mm-hmm. Um, has China ever been in a similar position as it is today? Okay, this is a two, three part question. Yeah. So a uh, longitudinal look at mm-hmm. things. Um, first, it's not just about Chinese history. Mm-hmm. History is history. Mm-hmm. Um, and to me, history is basically the study of human nature. Mm-hmm. So you're arguing for a, a more neutral and unbiased look at. There's the cultural aspect, of course, to of human course. behavior. But when you strip it down, there seems to be some running themes that yeah, go I mean, beyond just geographical location. I mean, if we go by what Elon Musk will be calling the, what, the first order thinking, mm-hmm. where you strip everything down and then mm-hmm. you build back up from the first, first principles. Of, yeah. First principles, yeah. Mm-hmm. So humans are humans. Mm-hmm. You know, after humans, then you have different humans. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's such a bad way to put it. Yeah. But yeah, um, I'm interested in Chinese history because of the the cultural and the stories aspect of it. Mm-hmm. But uh, if we are talking at a very macro view, history is history. It doesn't matter which uh, part of the world these people come from. They will all display the very basic human nature. Mm-hmm. So the study of history or the when you are looking at history is always looking at uh, human nature at work. I mean, the times might change, the location might change, and today we'll say maybe platforms will change, but humans never change. <laughs> we've been the same, you know, we've been the same since day one, since the day we walked out of Africa with fire or something like that. Mm-hmm. We've been the same, we never change. Mm-hmm. So yeah, uh, and that I is think, something um, that I realized. If I, can, if I can probe you there a little bit further, yeah. um, could you maybe help us unpack that a bit more? Um, when you say humans don't change, that's yeah. referring to our operating system, um, 
or our methods, the way we organize ourselves? Um, our nature, okay, this is going to be a very, very unpopular take. Mm -hmm. Human nature is selfish, mm. self benefits before everything else. We'll take care of ourselves, then we mm. take care of our family, then we take care of our clan, then mm. we take care of, you know, it's a yeah. con series of concentric circles. Yeah. So this is what human does. And if anything, history, if you read all kinds of history, it mm -hmm. could be African history, it could be European history, it could be Chinese history. Mm -hmm. This nature is always on display. Mm -hmm. It's always taking care of myself or my people first. And this is um, human nature and history mm -hmm. in a nutshell. How mm -hmm. and is the how do I take care of my own people? Mm, that's how where the nuances take, fall or the yes, differences lie. Where everything is different. The what is consistent, the how. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's that, it's simply that. Mm -hmm. It's simply that. And we have unfortunately have not evolved to the point where we can look at humanity as, you know, within that concentric circle like the entire humanity in one circle. I do not believe that any one of us have evolved to that level. Mm -hmm. We are still differentiating. There is still a lot of us versus them in the world, mm -hmm. in society today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When we're all sharing the same resource, the planet. Earth. Yeah, until the Martians come, I don't <laughs> think we will draw that circle because yeah. there's nothing external now. There's no other. The there's, no, there's no external threat. Mm -hmm. You know, human nature will always find an external threat to fight against. Mm -hmm. And... That's what it is. And that's what history is. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's a longitudinal view of history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And what was the second part of your question again? I'm sorry. Um, so from your study of, of Chinese history, um, mm. China is situa situated in a very unique place at the moment. It's mm -hmm. oh, yeah. number two in a multitude of ways in relation mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. US mm -hmm. in a time where the US had been the unipolar, unipolar sorry, uh, um, 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 influence on the world's global structure today. So mm -hmm. uh, some call it the Thucydides trap, where it's inevitable that the rising power would uh, have a confrontation with the incumbent power. Mm -hmm. So has China ever been in a similar position as it is now? when it was ranked number two and it has to, um, in a competition to, I don't know if that's indeed China's intention. That's for another discussion. Yeah. Um, but yeah, has China ever, ever been in a similar position historically? In short, no. Mm -hmm. In short, no. Um, <clears throat> one thing a lot of people overlook mm -hmm. is that um, the, the Western world, I mean, for one of a better word, the Western world, has only been in a position of um, power uh, for the past 200 years. Mm -hmm. If we take like so what you the, say just the British now, Empire and then yeah, post yes. World War II, the yes. Americans coming so in. So if we are talking about like what we mentioned just now, the longitudinal view mm -hmm. of history, which we could say, if we want to talk about the Egyptians or we want to talk about the Babylonians, you know, mm -hmm. 6,000, 8,000 years, mm -hmm all the way back, the Western world has only been on top for 200 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, let that sink in. 200 yeah. out of this millennium mm -hmm. of uh, history. Yeah. They've only been there for that period of time. Where and if the clear we, number one. Yes, where they are the clear number where they dominate mm -hmm. in all um, areas. Only 200 years out of mm -hmm. thousands. And if we are going to be more specific and look at China uh, specifically, we mentioned just now, during the Song Dynasty, China's economy is triple the size of the entire Europe of the same time. And we are talking about the 12th century, if I'm not wrong. Mm. Ah, 11th and 12th century. So 11th, 12th century, China's economy is three times of the entire Europe. And it was even during the Ming Dynasty, until the 1400s, China's Economy was still about what 80 percent, 60 percent of the entire world. Mm -hmm. And if we put in the entire Eastern world, that means China, India, and all the, the Asia, if we talk about the entire Asia, um, if, throughout most of history, Asia has held uh, most of the economical power in, in, on the globe. Mm 
it was only 200 years that the Western powers had, had came to be on top. And so has China ever been in this position? No, of course mm. not. Mm. Of course not. You know, they have always been the dominant presence, you know, in, 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 in global politics since ancient history. The only difference is that uh, China has never seek to assert itself on its neighbors. Mm. You know, the Chinese do not have a colonization mindset. Mm -hmm. They do not seek to colonize. They only seek to be respected and recognized. Recognized mm -hmm. instead of colonized. That's mm -hmm. what China wants. Simple mm -hmm. as that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you were saying uh, to challenge for supremacy. Uh, I don't think they really want to challenge. Like it's not their intention to challenge. But uh, if they have to, they have to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because yeah. they are very sensitive about what is perceived as their domestic territories. Uh, oh, yeah. For an yeah. observer, it might seem like an international confrontation, but in their minds, it's a domestic issue. <laughs> Leave it which to which us. brings back to mm. this uh, whole series of dynasties mm. rising mm. and falling. You know, you were saying mm. centralized, split, centralized, split, centralized, mm. split. Yep. And so to China, to the Chinese mindset, this mm. is just another period where the empire was split. Mm it would be reunified again. Mm -hmm. You know, it should and be unified co again. Correct me if I'm wrong, because um, my my study of, of, of history is not deep at all. Uh, mm. But from my observations of maps, at least, mm. looking at maps, which are, of course, graphical secondary representations, they're not <laughs> the real thing, <laughs> but it's the best that I've got access to. Uh, the times where there were outward expansion is when there were non-Han uh, um, dynasties in power. Would that be correct? Like the Manchurians, uh, the Mongolians, there was eastward. There was, was that westward expansion? Westward. Yeah. There was uh, westward I, I, expansion, actually, right? Towards Central yeah, Asia. Yeah. No, 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 no. no. Um, actually, some of the biggest expansions came during mm. the Han Dynasty and the Tang Dynasty. I see. Those were really very Han. So they come <laughs> both south and west, I'm assuming. West. Uh, the Han West. Dynasty was when the Silk Road was built. Mm. Uh, the, the Han Dynasty was the one that actually consolidated um, this uh, the Northwest where mm -hmm. they open up the Silk Road. Yeah. That's during the Han Dynasty, during the King uh, Emperor Wu of Han, Han Wu Di. Yeah. That's where they consolidated the Silk Road. And I that, see the Silk Road, yeah. Yeah, so from Tun Huang all the way out to the Stan, Xinjiang and all these places, that was actually from the Han Dynasty. And this was uh, during the time of the Roman Empire? It's about the same? Um, 200 AD? That's like what? After the Romans? Mm -hmm. uh, Han, yeah, no, 200 BC, sorry. 200 BC, yeah, about uh, Caesar, Julius Caesar of 49 BC. This is 200 yeah. BC. So, so mm -hmm. yeah, slightly before, uh, around Julius Caesar's time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's where we move west. And, um, and um, back then, we still did not colonize these places. We set up uh, what they set up, what was called the Western Protectorate. So they built like, you know, military bases and garrisons along the Silk Road to protect the traders that were coming in from Persia and from uh, the Chinese Empire moving uh, west into the Roman Empire and into the, the Persian uh, Empire. And if I'm not wrong, there were actually some um, documents. This would be interesting, but I do not know them very well. There were some documents that talk about a uh, contact between the Han people of that time and the Roman people of their time. Mm -hmm. The bison, eh, no, was it the bison? No, the Romans. Yeah, so they had contact. The traders actually had contact. Persia confirmed we had contact. Uh, as far as we know, there were contact between the Romans and the Chinese, and there were contact between the Egyptians and the Chinese. Mm -hmm. And that's how far the entire trade route went, the Silk Road. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've managed to pull something out from, from YouTube, which I'm going right. to share to the screen if that's okay. So the probably don't need the sound. Yeah, this is worrying state. So... And this will be the Qin state. The Qin state. Yep, and this is the Qin dynasty. Yeah. Let me progress onwards. Yeah, this Han is the dynasty. Western Protectorate, this part. Yeah, so this is where we're at. This is where our conversation is at. Yes, um, yes. So trying to find a path towards the West. Yes. The initials of the Silk Road, I believe. Bidding up, establishing to that. And they've got a three kingdoms, which I 
must say I love because I used to play the games. I'm one of those <laughs> that played the games. I've watched the TV series, but I've never really read the actual proper history. <laughs> most, pro most famous uh, yeah. era in Chinese history. Mm. Because so many ideas were exported from China at that time. I mean, Japan has a huge fascination for the Three Kingdom stories, as I'm told. <laughs> they are bigger fans of the Three Kingdom than the Chinese. <laughs> yeah, they're huge. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we keep going. And yeah, it looks like it's all operating within. Yeah, this line. And then the Sui moved out again. Yep. And then the Tang, Tang will conquer all the way to right. all the stuns. And the Tang court had a very um, large ratio of Turkic, uh, the Turks, mm -hmm. uh, as officials. Mm. The Tang court was actually more uh, foreigners than uh, Han people, actually. The core will be Han people, but they actually took talent from wherever they can find. Yeah. So uh, if you know the Japanese premier, the previous Japanese premier, uh, Mr. Shinzo Abe, he was actually extremely proud of the fact that one of his ancestors was actually one of the court officials in the Tang court. And he will actually bring up that point quite often. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> we'll continue. That's an interesting note. Yeah. Um, we'll keep unpacking the yeah. visual history and yeah, so it seems to have reverted yeah, back. The five, di uh, five dynasty, ten kingdoms. Mm. The Jing, the Song. Okay, that part the is, uh, the Jing and the Song part would be, yeah, uh, we, we, need to, we need to explain that okay. a bit. Because right. that map, okay. So this is the Song. Mm -hmm. This is the Jing. The Jing are the Jurchens. The Jurchens is up here. In these the... are Jurchens, okay? Yeah. And Cixia, these are the Tanguts. The Cixia was the dominant northern power until mm -hmm. the Jurchens came in. Yeah. And the Song was supposed to be all the way, uh, the Chinese Empire, if we look at the previous map, would be supposed to be all the way even further I north. I see. Oh. So... so they were pushed. So this was still northern Song, but then by the time of the southern Song, mm -hmm. that map would be even smaller. The mm -hmm. southern Song would be like maybe until here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, and then the Yuan the Dynasty. Yuan, the Mongols. So we have in uh, Mongolia, Inner Mongolia, mm -hmm. the rest of the the the, the realm at that mm -hmm. time. Yeah. And then as we keep going, it's now 1410 with the Ming Dynasty. This is a little bit of headway into Southeast Asia uh, with, I think, parts of Vietnam. Then the Qing dynasty, 1892. And the Qing were the ones that actually formally took Tibet and yeah. count Tibet as uh, its, its... For the uh, first time, right? It's yes. It never happened before. And certain parts of Mongolia as well. Yeah. And in fact, um, the current northern... So this, this would be the biggest footprint ever. Yes. The, the dynasty. This, this um, border here is actually with Russia. Mm. And the Qing dynasty during Emperor Kangxi, if I'm not wrong, was actually the, the time where this border was actually set. Mm -hmm. And it lasts until um, the early days of the PRC, mm -hmm. where they renegotiated certain uh, parts of the border. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this will be the biggest footprint. And this is actually the area, uh, apart from Inner Mongolia, this area is that that Qing map is the map that the Chinese uh, government today would use as a reference mm -hmm. for what they will consider they are uh, de jure land. Yeah. Yeah. So it looks like based on this visual representation, um, yeah, most of the inward and outward motions occurred within a prefixed geographical area. Yes. Because this, uh, to the Northwest is all yeah. desert. To the yeah. Southwest is the Himalayas. Yeah. It's, and, I've been there physically and yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> so it's, it's, yeah. It's, 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 geographically it's impossible. Yeah. Yeah. And then we have the present People's Republic of China mm -hmm. and then the Republic of China mm -hmm. on this end. Um, going to stop sharing the screen and thank you so much for um, going through that with us. Ah, um, it's a pleasure. Um, if I can move on to another type of question, and sure. 
this relates to what are some of the um, key observations you've made um, ob nope, from, from Chinese history? Are there any running themes or, or patterns from about rather the Chinese model, if I can call it that, that you've noticed from your study of history? I, I guess uh, things are pretty much the same, similar across different civilization, mm -hmm. but you have a ruler and then you need to have a legitimacy of rule mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Uh, like we mentioned before, the what is always the same, is the how. Mm -hmm. The how. Mm -hmm. The how. And of course, there are some cultural differences between different cultures and traditions. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be very specific about some patterns of uh, Chinese history or what would set the Chinese or Eastern Asian uh, way of doing things that's mm -hmm. different from other yeah. people. I would I say- I like that description better. It's a way rather than yeah. a model. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I would say that it stems from the, from a geo, uh, partly geographical and partly cultural uh, way these people, this culture develop. Like, uh, in the East, uh, in China and, and most of these Eastern Asian countries, uh, we have what we call the agrarian culture mm -hmm. that sprung up because it was mainly land mass, a lot of flatlands. So you have a lot of farms that you grow grain and that's how you feed people. Mm -hmm. And that's how the economy grows, a, a, a agrarian system, farmers, a, a culture of farmers. Whereas uh, in the West, if we are talking about the birth of a Western civilization, we have to go all the way back to the Greeks and the Romans. And if we look at it geographically, that was an entire series of peninsulas, islands around the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. And so agriculture was not really very uh, uh, possible in a lot of cases. And so what sprang up in the West was a very merchantile culture. Mm -hmm. So trading was the basis. Trading, a lot yeah. of trade. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, the East is a lot of uh, farming. Yeah. So this over time, over millennia, we are talking about, you know, a so very on one long hand, period. we can grow stuff. On the other hand, less exchange. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that in order to be a agricultural society, in order for it to be successful, mm -hmm. you must have a, it must be a collective effort. Mm -hmm. One person cannot farm a piece of land. So you need many, many people to farm a piece of land, preferably within a family or within a clan, you know, and that's where we have this uh, culture and mindset, this DNA of, uh, okay, if, if one person is good, many people will be good together. You know, if mm. all of us work together, we can have benefits for all of us. Mm. It's a collective benefit kind of mm. mindset. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we look at traders or even today businesses, trade, trade and business is, I won't say all the time, but uh, a lot of the time, most of the time is a zero sum game. Mm. For me to there's win- There's a winner, there's a loser. Yeah. There's a winner and there's a loser, mm. exactly. And so this will inform the evolution of the culture between these two uh, parts of the world. So from a geographical to a, uh, lived experience to it becoming hard set into tradition and culture. Mm -hmm. So we always have to be mindful of this mindset difference between the two, two peoples, you know. Of course, like I said before, human nature is always look for benefits, but it's how we look for benefits for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So in the East, because of the geographical uh, and the, the reasons and the, the, the history of how this society were built, they have the how became a collective how. Whereas in the other end of the globe, it became an individual how of uh, seeking benefits. So is one better than the other or is one right and one wrong? No, of course not. It's not. Not one is, uh, one is not better than the other. Uh, neither one is right or wrong. It's just how it happened and how it, it, it works for their situation. So that is the, 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 the difference between the East and the West. And that is uh, why, you know, today a lot of the West look at the East and they can't figure it out, you know, you know especially in this uh, pandemic. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we all wear masks, like it's nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, we just willingly wear the mask. 
and not much of a complaint or whatever, you know, just, oh yeah, we have to wear a mask, we wear a mask. Why? Because collectively is good for everyone. Mm-hmm. You know, we are not thinking like, oh, I, I, I don't want to because I can't breathe or mm-hmm. I don't want to because I feel un- uncomfortable. There's no individual uh, preference mm-hmm. in this situation because the mm-hmm. bigger overriding concern is a collective good. And this collective good is an idea that is hard-coded into our DNA. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, specifically, like you say, how how is it different so in the It's a cultural DNA that yeah. dates back from the foundations of the empire because... Um, Not even the empire. I think dates back to the foundation of humanity on this mm-hmm. piece of land. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because even the early prehistoric people, if they want to farm, mm-hmm. they have to farm together. Mm-hmm. There's no way you can farm alone. Beyond that, um, yes. so zero-sum game um, as part versus of the collective. mental programming versus collective benefits. Mm-hmm. Um, is there another um, feature of, 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 of running theme from Chinese history that you'd like to share with the audience? Well, the Chinese people are extremely pragmatic lot. Pragmatic. And mm. Extremely pragmatic. And uh, basically, you could say that we are a-religious. Or... Pragmatic and a-religious. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, if you notice, since I you know, went through the list of dynasties, mm-hmm. there was no... And in fact, if you look at it today, there is no Chinese religion. There is no Chinese religion apart from you know, ancestral worship and respect for the heavens. There is no mm-hmm. um, codified... So that's more like a ritual, right? That, yeah, it's that, more that, of yeah. a ritual and tradition. Yeah. Uh, I mean, a lot of people will argue like when they say, you know, what about Taoism? Taoism yeah. is not a religion. If you Taoism, read it, it's far from religion. <laughs> Taoism was yeah. actually one of the 10 schools of philosophy you know, mm-hmm. we, we, that mm-hmm. came out in the warring, uh, spring yeah. and autumn period. So it became a religion later, much later during the Han Dynasty and once again because of political reasons. Mm -hmm. So yeah, even when it comes to religion, the Chinese are very pragmatic because Mm -hmm. it serves a political purpose. Mm -hmm. Confucianism is not a religion, it's a philosophy, it's a study of uh, social structure. And Buddhism, it it is a religion, but it's not Chinese. It came from Mm -hmm. India. It was an import. Mm -hmm. It was an import. So yeah, the Chinese people are not inherently religious. There is no, um, I mean, do we believe in a higher power? I, I guess so. I guess every human would be- believe there is some sort of a higher power. But are they religious about it? No. Uh, no. So this is a very a-religious uh, people compared to the West, if we want to put it that way. I'm so uncomfortable talking about East and West, but mm-hmm. for one of a better word, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, The West, of course, you know, the development of the Abrahamic uh, traditions where you have a very black and white duality going on. Mm -hmm. uh, You're either with us or you're against us. You're either right or you're wrong. So that is a very two-tone view that the, the West would take. And I guess that could be part of the evolution of their merchandise past where it's zero sum it's always zero sum that that way of thinking so that could be part of it whereas to the east it is more of a yeah you do you i do me as long as you don't overstep your boundary i'm fine Mm -hmm. do whatever you need to do just don't tell me what to do (laughs) yeah yeah Um, on that note of being a religious if i Mm. can offer a point to kind of complement that uh, mm. because from your study you have mentioned um, what is the mandate of heaven right and uh, legitimization of authority uh, right. could you unpack that for us a little bit more please the mandate of heaven i mean tianzi right it's that am i getting the... uh tianzi is son of heaven son of heaven that yeah. is the person who holds the mandate holds of the mandate okay so the mandate of heaven is a tian tian yi tian xin Mm-hmm. So that is a political term to legitimize the rule of the king or the emperor of the realm, of the sovereign of the mm-hmm. realm. Um, it's a way to legitimize, I mean, you know, you always must have justification for why are you overthrowing the previous ruler? They might have done something really crappy or whatever, but still, um, due to hierarchy, they are still your lord, they are still your king. So you must have a very, very good reason to overthrow him and 
give the throne to yourself. And the only power that is greater than humanity is the heavens. Mm-hmm. Therefore, oh, the heavens told me to do it. The heavens yeah. say that I have to do it. This is a mission from the gods or mm-hmm. the mission from the heavens. And so I'm overthrowing the, the incumbent. And now that I'm on the seat, now that I'm on the throne, what is my legitimacy? You know? Mm-hmm. Oh, because I'm the son of heaven. Right. Why am I the son of heaven? Because I carried out the mandate of heaven. Mm-hmm. But if we are going to break it down, this is not some religious mumbo jumbo that's going on. This is a very political way of saying the Propaganda. mandate. No, the mandate of the people. Mm-hmm. Oh, this is the say, will of the people. The will of the people. The mm-hmm. mandate of heaven is the will of the people. Mm. That is, uh, in fact, it is documented and written in uh, certain old texts that the mandate of heaven is in actual fact the will of the people. Carrying out the mandate of heaven is representing and carrying out the will of the people. So that ideology has been ingrained in Chinese rulers yeah. since, uh, you know, uh, thousands of years, mm-hmm. for thousands of years. That has always been the, the mindset that I am representing and carrying out the will of the people. And why do I lose the throne? How do I lose the throne? When I lose the mandate of heaven. And what do they mean by losing the mandate of heaven? That means you lose you lose the support of the people. You lose the will of the people. Related to that, um, I guess getting that mandate of heaven right, gives you um, political influence over centralizing. Like this centralizing is for you. It's for your benefit. It's the will of not just yourself, but the collective as well. Um, could you give us a few comments on the running themes of centralized power as a method of organization? Um, your thoughts on that, please. Uh, centralized would you care power. to e- elaborate on mm-hmm. the question a bit? I think previously when we had a chat, um, yeah. you're relating to centralized power, you know, shifting from an organizational structure oh, yeah. from the previous hierarchy feudal style to a reward system oh. and also about the long-term intergenerational, what long-term, oh, yes. Oh, yes. intergenerational, like long-term thinking, I suppose, rather than just thinking of the immediate of and course. the now. So if I can hand the time over to you, um, your thoughts so, on centralized power. Yeah. Centralized power. I mean, a lot of mm. people look at centralized power today as a bad thing. Mm-hmm. It's not. It's efficient. It's the most efficient way of getting things done. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, that's another hot take, another mm. unpopular view, but uh, facts are facts. When the Qin Dynasty abolished the feudal system as it was in existence and moved into the centralized province system, we mentioned just now he just appointed uh, administrators mm-hmm. into these different yeah. regions. And in some so, ways, modern China is doing it with their Zong Su Ji, is the secretary. Yes, it that is runs bas- the provinces. It is basically the same system that has been passed now through generations for the past two thousand years. Yeah. It's so it maybe not same- quite runs, but it's responsible for yeah. the province. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, it is the same system. Um, mm-hmm. Of course, evolved with the times, but yeah. at the core of it, the province system is still the same system from mm-hmm. the Qin Dynasty until today, mm-hmm. uh, where you have this province and then you have an administrator in charge of a province who carries out the the will of the central government which back in the day was the Qin royal court the imperial court and it's extremely efficient because you don't have a local warlord a local duke or prince who maybe did not like certain parts of this um, idea and refuse to implement certain things and you do not have a local warlord or a prince Mm -hmm who would uh, implement his own tax system, for example, because he wanted to make more money or build himself a new palace. Mm -hmm. You know, everything is standardized. They actually have, uh, what do you call it? The the work review, uh, annual annual report. Annual report. (laughs) Yeah, like like today, the Qin Qin Dynasty had that. So So it's a HR innovation. That was, yes, exactly. I mean, imagine this was 200 BC. And they have these ideas that are so ahead of their time. Mm. Like, of course, uh, these uh, reviews did not happen every year. It was uh, it happened every three years. So these administrators or every level of officials during the Qin, uh, under the Qin administration, 
will go through this review. And if you did a good job, you know, you will be promoted or, you know, re redeployed. If you did a bad job, you'll be fired. And um, yeah, the chin being the chin, most probably beheaded and executed if you did a bad job. Mm -hmm. So extra incentive to do mm -hmm. a good job on, uh, on yes. um, managing the people and the land. Mm -hmm. So that was a system that uh, was greatly efficient and mm -hmm. it is scalable and it is a copy and paste. Yeah. You don't have, of course, you localize for local situations, but the general form of the administrative system, the uh, the company structure, if you yeah. would, you know, the court structure yeah. can be copied and pasted all over the land. And that's mm -hmm. why they can expand so fast. So the number of innovations from the standardizing of language systems yeah. as well, yeah. during that time, making and it scalable. And that's just one of it. Yeah. Yeah. And just I recall from it. my visits to Chinese villages, it's, do you still see some memory of that? Like you enter each village and then there is the notice board right at the very front of it with all the things you should oh, do yeah. and you should not do. And it's very, very, for lack of a better word, um, physically black and white. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can read, right? There's no reason that you cannot uh, make and meaning back of in this. the days, yeah. uh, this, this, yes, this actually mm. came even earlier than the Qin, yeah. even earlier. Even so though, what happened, mm -hmm. uh, but the Qin adapted this system, the notice board at the village. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened was, uh, you know, back then, not everyone could read, like yeah. you say just now. So they actually have this legal officer stationed uh -huh. at this, uh, near this uh, notice board, where mm -hmm. they will explain to the commoners about the laws and the regulations of the land to these uh, villagers. So they have no excuse to break the law. Yeah. Yeah, so this was a hangover from that time as well. Yeah. And another way to look at it is that there is absolute transparency. Like, oh, <laughs> it's yeah. all here. There's no hiding it. We're looking yeah, at the do same this, don't do that. <laughs> physical documents. Oh, yeah. um, if I can hold your time just for a little bit longer, because I'm sure. monitoring it's already at a close to the two hour mark, wow. I think we will maybe sum up our conversation today uh, oh, with this one final question. And then we'll leave the aspects on the Chinese diaspora. Uh, for another time. So sorry for going on and on. Yeah, that's 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 all good. Um, that's fantastic. It means we already have material for part two of this. Um, so if I could kind of like round things up um, mm -hmm. for us, uh, from my perspective, uh, what I'm particularly interested in is the the rise and decline, the ebb and flows of the dynasties, and if there's mm -hmm. any running theme. Um, I do think people often make the mistake, and I'm not sure if that's the case, that in saying that Chinese civilization is the longest continuing civilization because there's been so many times it had to fall apart and come back together again. Um, um, was there any specific dynasty that you've studied that has caught your attention the most in terms of sorry for the two part questions again <laughs> in terms of the fall number one um, and then number two in terms of its rise so if we could start with the specific dynasty that you've studied that has caught your attention the most in terms of this of its decline we'll start there and then the rise afterwards i'll get to the fall in a while yeah the rise uh, i think we mentioned earlier we'll start the well. rise yeah Mm -hmm. The rise, uh, we mentioned earlier as well, uh, the Qin dynasties, the rise from a small state to a, 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 a imperial court to, to empire, from yeah. state to empire. That's a pretty big jump. Yeah, and that's very, the velocity is insane. Uh, within about <laughs> 160 of years. 160 yeah. years. Yeah. I mean, if we are talking about the setup to the yeah. rise. So it's good um, administration, mm -hmm. um, scalable systems, and uh, efficiency and pragmatism. They are not hung up about idealism and ideology. They are very hung up about pragmatism. How can this be more efficient? How can yep. this work better? Let's focus and, on the numbers. <laughs> yeah, focus on the numbers. Very, very technocratic way of doing things. <laughs> yeah. Legalism, yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that is a very technocratic uh, ideology. And mm -hmm. um, it, it is in the execution, how far, how extreme they took this um, ideology. That was what uh, allowed for the rise of the Qin dynasty. But at the same time, it was also how far they took this ideology that caused their fall. Because mm, where is the threshold? Yes. The system where, limits. Yeah. Where do you draw the line? Yes, where's the system limits in, mm. in today's uh, terms? That's mm. what we will say. So what happened was that power was so centralized that any little mistake in the central court would have massive repercussion throughout the entire realm. Mm. 
Mm. And that was exactly what happened after the first emperor died. He passed away, palace coup happened, political coup happened, and everything just crashed into pieces because the central government held so much power without checks and balances. Mm -hmm. And that was the ultimate demise of the, the empire. And that's why it lasted only 15 years because it could not stand any small little um, deviation from, from, from the norm. So not very nimble and capable uh, yes, of correcting because, itself. Although we said that it was scalable, but it also comes to a point where the scale is so large that you can't really move very nimbly or... Maybe the opposite is true as well. It's too nimble. Mm -hmm. Like every small change, every small tweak you make to the so system. The butterfly effect on the rest. Yes, the butterfly effect just mm. spreads out and mm. causes chaos across the realm. Mm. And so, yeah, that was a rise and fall. But ultimately, uh, generally, we are talking about declines of dynasty or declines of uh, any form of uh, political system. Uh, we have to understand end of the day, if we are going to go back to the first order of thinking again, that politics and governance is effectively about the economy. And the economy is about the control and distribution of resources. You know, there's this cake here. How do I distribute this cake to everyone so that everyone is happy? Am I right to say that? Mm -hmm. So a government, let's say a government of Singapore, is basically in charge of how to distribute the resources at, at their fingers, at their fingertips to the citizens of the people and how to help the citizens, you know, uh, acquire resources for themselves. That is the role of any government, be it a feudal government, an imperial government, or uh, today in our modern day system. So Politics and governance is about economy and the economy is about control and distribution of the resources. And generally, generally, most of these ancient dynasties, if we look through history, be it Chinese, be it Western, be it any dynasty, any ruling system through history, most of them fail because the distribution of these resources became more and more lopsided. The ruling class started taking more and more for themselves because they got so comfortable and so complacent and so arrogant in their position that they lost touch with the ground, lost touch with the people and they mm -hmm. forgot, you know, that their, their job is to ensure that this distribution is, you know, at least not so unfair. And the result of this more and more lopsided, uh, what, what do you call that, e irregular, uh, unfair distribution of resources, it got so bad that over time, the bottom rung of society would lack even the basic resources to survive. Mm. And that is what would cause a uprising or a revolt because it's a death sentence anyway. I do nothing. I got no food to eat. If I revolt and I try to overthrow this yep. uh, dynasty, at least I have a chance. Yeah. So it gets so bad that the peasants each eventually with the backs against the wall. Yes. Peasant no uprising. There has been yeah. un untold numbers of peasant uprisings in Chinese mm -hmm. history. I don't know about the West, but in Chinese yeah. history, we have tons of peasant uprisings. Yeah. Three kingdoms like you love so much started mm -hmm. with the Yellow Turban Rebellion. Mm -hmm. What was it? It was basically- People on the fringe who were upset and yes. they were able to they were trigger starving. off a chain of events. Yeah, They were starving. They down revolted. To survival. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all down to survival. Uh, the, the, the most, the bloodiest civil war in human history was a Taiping Rebellion in the Qing Dynasty. I believe that civil war in China itself during the Qing Dynasty killed more people than the Second World War. That happened because the people were starving as well. So the Han Dynasty rose up under Liu Bang mm. was also another person rebellion that overthrew the Qin Dynasty because resource distribution was not taken care of. Yeah. And Almost every other uh, form of dynasty is a version of this uh, unequal distribution of resources, and uh, how. And the only difference is how politicized it was. Yeah, and, and of how, course, all this occurs in a place where you've got such critical mass in terms of population oh numbers. Oh yes. Oh yes. 
from the tens of millions in the early days to the hundreds of millions uh, and if to I, the billion. If, and, <laughs> That's and, a and lot of hungry people. A lot. And if I'm <laughs> if and if I'm not wrong, there was uh, some kind of a correlation that um, some people made. Uh, this, this some people did a research, and mm. they made a correlation between the population number of China and the peasant rebellions that were happening. Mm -hmm. And usually, the peasant rebellions will happen when there was a period of peak population in China, mm -hmm. and that rebellion would usually overthrow the ruling dynasty, and the new dynasty will come back. Mm -hmm. So, so that's a test when the Chinese yeah. go hungry. So. Yes. And you know, uh, Chinese, we always say, Ming is Shi Wei Tian. You know, food is most important to the Chinese people. Yep. The hierarchy so, of needs, food. Yeah. So when we don't have enough to eat, when we get mm. hungry, we get hangry. Man. Yeah. And a hangry <laughs> Chinese man is not someone yeah. you want to, you want yeah. to deal with. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Something with we'll dynasties. certainly unpack in yeah. a later episode when the Chinese get hangry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so if I could, if I could um, maybe just ask you for one more favor um, yeah, sure. to close off today's session, is mm. there anything you would like to recommend our viewers to, to read, uh, to watch or experience just to understand uh, China that little bit better? Okay, and uh, let me put on show very perfectly human nature at play. Mm -hmm. Watch my channel. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That Chinese history guy on that YouTube. That Chinese history guy, everybody. Just go yep. search for it. Yeah, mm -hmm. watch my channel. Uh, watch Bob's channel. Uh, he's doing great job uh, regarding the Chinese diaspora. I've been, I've been, uh, we've been friends for many years and I, I know about his work for quite a while now. He's doing really great work. So watch Bob's channel, go read Bob's papers, go be his student in class if you want to. <laughs> yeah, if you can. So mm -hmm. yeah, uh, there are a couple of uh, channels on YouTube and podcasts that are pretty good if you want to understand a bit more about the Chinese history and culture. You know, uh, Mr. Les Montgomery from Teacup Media is, doing, Media. A pretty, is mm -hmm. doing a pretty good job. Uh, teacup media also on YouTube, and there's this uh, pretty interesting another podcast YouTube channel called The Chronicler Chronicler Chinese History. So, I, I guess we'll put the links to this channel in the description, in the, box. In the description box so mm -hmm. you can check them out as well. So, yeah, those are uh, uh, interesting channels. But, end of the day, it doesn't matter what you read or what you watch or what you listen to. Most importantly, I believe, is to keep an open mind. Like just keep an open mind and look at things from a higher altitude and a longer horizon and think, you know, really put on your thinking cap and think if what you read or what you've seen or what you heard actually makes sense when you look at it from a longer time horizon and from a higher altitude. Because that is usually a very good way to figure out if things make sense. Look at it from higher and longer point of view. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Looking at things from a higher altitude and from a longer horizon point of view. This is the Both Sides Now podcast signing off for the week. Thank you so much for tuning in. And thank you, RP, for spending the time with us today. Take Thanks, care, Bob. everybody. Have a good one. Bye. Bye-bye. And in three, two, one.